So I think we're ready to start. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to all of our business partners joining this very special edition of our Zero Carbon Project Community Forum call. So last month, you remember, we have a very interesting presentation from uh, Henkel Company on their decarbonization journey. Today, we're joined by our colleagues from ArcelorMittal, a long time and a strong partner who will share the insight of their actions to decarbonize their own businesses. Next slide. My name is Christophe Kikompois. You know it by now. I'm the Vice President for Sustainable Procurement at Schneider Electric, leading, among others, the implementation of the Zero Carbon Project. As a reminder, these community calls are a safe space for peer-to-peer -peer learning and best practice sharing that help us leverage collective intelligence in the decarbonization journey. And in this spirit, our speaker today will share how ArcelorMittal is successfully lowering the greenhouse gas emission from a hard to abate sector, essentially showing us that it is possible to reduce emission even in a sector that are apparently considered difficult. So putting a little bit of pressure on all of us, you don't have any excuse of not doing it anymore. And this is also the main objective of the zero carbon projects, to have more and more companies embarking on a strong decarbonization journey. Next slide, please. In order to support uh, all of you, all of our partners, we have implemented a series of mechanisms, which ranges from a variety of trainings, including live session delivered twice, two times a week, to recorded session hosted on a self-help portal available around the clock, the NEO network, to even experts advisory service, should one of you want to explore and engage and finally make customized solution available to our partners. We also engage with CDP, this is new, which is one of the most credible and widely accepted disclosure uh, company for carbon emission. So one of the key benefits of reporting in CDP is that it asks companies to respond to a very comprehensive questionnaire and companies need to have a robust planning and implementation in place to respond, thus improving the overall maturity of the topic of decarbonization. In the next months, some of you will be contacted by CDP and they will advise you on the different support and make you aware of the development in addition to what Schneider Electric is doing. So please follow the steps prescribed by them, essentially the carbon emission disclosure in CDP that will guide you and support your effort to build a strong decarbonization plan. We are also working on a couple of other new things that we will inform you in the future while those things are shaping up. I strongly, strongly recommend you to access the new network for ZCP, for Zero Carbon Project web portal, in which you find a lot of support for you in this journey. So we hope that you will explore and utilize all of this uh, material, all, all of this support framework that we have been uh, putting in place for you. You know, as we told you at the beginning of this uh, journey, we're not leaving you alone. We're working with you uh, to ensure that we are aggressive in decarbon decarbonizing our supply chain. Next slide, please. As I told you, uh, two minutes ago. So today the session is one of the initiatives where we invite global leaders on decarbonization and we ask them to share the experience on how they are approaching decarbonization and what, what works well for them, what did not work for them, and so that we can all benefit from the, this experience and er, enrich your own journey. Today I have the great uh, pleasure to welcome ArcelorMittal, who will take you through their journey. I'm very happy to introduce Annie Heaton, a corporate sustainability strategy and engagement lead at ArcelorMittal. Annie has been managing corporate responsibility and sustainability for ArcelorMittal Group for the past nine years and has played a leading role in the company's decarbonization strategy. I am also delighted to welcome Chantal Breton, who is the head of product and business development at ArcelorMittal Downstream Solution and Emmanuel Blanc, Key Account Manager at ArcelorMittal Downstream Slating Service Center for West Europe. Next slide. Now, before I hand it over to Emmanuel, some quick housekeeping tips as usual. 
please stay engaged. As you know, the value of this session is really about listening what the others have to bring us and what they are doing, and also bouncing back on that. Your microphone microphone has been muted because we have a large number of people. Um, so please use the chat as usual to ask your question, to interact with uh, the presenters, uh, as well as to participate in some polls that we will have along the presentation. And as usual, this session is recorded and will will be made available to the participate participating suppliers on new network. So with this context and introduction, I hand it over to Emmanuel. Emmanuel, stage is yours. Thank you, Christophe. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. So ArcelorMittal is one of the world's leader in steel and mining with approximately 168,000 employees in more than 60 countries and an industrial presence in 17 countries. We are a leading company in all major global steel markets, including automotive, construction, household appliances and packaging with world-class research and development and outstanding distribution networks. ArcelorMittal Downstream Solutions covers the downstream activities of ArcelorMittal, especially in Europe. To meet specific customer requirements in both the automotive and industrial sectors, ArcelorMittal provides distribution of long and flat products, as well as value-added and customized steel solution through further processing by steel service centers. ArcelorMittal Downstream Solution has been working in a close partnership with Schneider Electric all over the world for more than 40 years. So we have built together strong and reliable relationships based on common values like leadership, product innovation and sustainability. That's why the travel to the zero carbon is the challenge we are sharing together for the next years. Chantal, it's over to you. Good morning, everybody. So our steel service centers are backed up by our group's innovation resources, offering targeted solution with high performance product. And our strength lies in our dedicated development team, supported by expert researchers, and broad comprehensive program addressing business needs allow us to develop with unrivaled physical properties and technical characteristics for steel. So we are really guiding the evolution of steel to secure the best future for the industry and for generations to come. With our approach, we work towards long-term commitment by always bringing solution. We are consistently improving quality development and new product and new application. So innovation is really key focus for ArcelorMittal Steel Service Center, which makes us the global steel supplier of choice. And together with our customer, we are forging new frontiers with our new product and we are progressing with our customer into a decarbonized future. So really thank you for Schneider, our partner and customer for inviting us and thanks for participating to this call and I'll let the floor to Annie. Thank you, Chantal. So if we could go to the next slide, Please, I think uh, Chantal and Emmanuel have, um, have have given you a summary and overview of ArcelorMittal, which you can see on this slide. But I just want to draw your attention uh, to one, one of these um, items, which is the CO2 footprint. That's what we're here to talk about today. So in 2020, ArcelorMittal's CO2 footprint was 160 million tonnes. And that, due to the COVID pandemic, was a year of lower steel production volumes. So we have, as you can see, quite a challenge on our hands. Um, and as has been said, steel is, a, is, is what is called a hard to abate sector. It's, it's not an easy challenge. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about how ArcelorMittal are approaching this. And I hope you'll find some of what I have to say useful in your own business. What I'd like to do before diving into our, our decarbonisation plans um, 
I'd like to just give you a little bit of context about how ArcelorMittal sees sustainability and then give you a bit of context about how our decarbonisation challenge fits within us as an industry, as a steel industry, because these are both, I think, two really important contexts. So if we go to the next slide, please. Just to, just to kind of crystallise where we are today, last year ArcelorMittal set an ambitious target to, to decarbonise 25% reduction in our CO2 emissions intensity per tonne of steel by 2030 across the world. And that's in the, the 17 countries, which as Santel said, where we actually make steel. And in Europe, where we have about half of our steel production, we've gone even more ambitious with a 35% reduction. So in a hard to abate sector, how are we going to achieve that? Let's stand back a little and if we go to the next slide, please. I'll, give, I'll, I'll outline three or four aspects of our sustainability context. One more slide, thank you. So if I go back to 2015, which is a pretty important year for the climate with the Paris Agreement, but also in that year, the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals were, were launched. About six months before that, ArcelorMittal launched our 10 Sustainable Development Outcomes. They're a pretty sim similar kind of idea. And they provide us with a broad framework for sustainable development at ArcelorMittal. And they range from health and safety through to carbon, uh, resource efficiency, air emissions, community, uh, and of course, um, the, the, the talent that we're going to need to transform our industries for the future. So the 17 sustainable development outcomes really are a kind of a narrative within ArcelorMittal that describe the company that we know we must become. So there's something that everyone can focus on and, and galvanise their, their motivation around. Next slide, please. Alongside our carbon commitments, we have a number of other commitments that, that cover all the issues that we have seen as being material to our business. And for the sustainability practitioners out there, you'll know the importance of the materiality lens. Now, the, none of these are easy targets to meet. Um, the, the, well, I've talked about the climate targets, the safety targets, uh, and our, our gender target for, a, for an industry. It's not only hard to abate, but it's also um, has a very low proportion of women. These are all very demanding targets. Um, and again, for the, the final one, Responsible Steel Certification, I'll come on to talk about that. That is also a very challenging um, uh, direction of travel for us, little. But they all they cover all of our sustainable development material issues, and they're all intended to lead us to the company's purpose, which is to create smarter steels for a better world. Next slide, please. So coming on to another really important aspect of how we approach sustainability, we have over the over the over the years developed a very strong system of governance, and that goes right from the shop floor where we're managing the way steel is produced, right up to the oversight from our board of directors. We have an independent uh, sustainability committee made up of independent directors, and then at, at senior management level we have a, a sustainable development council. And that brings in all the perspectives from the leadership of the business, from strategy, environment, corporate responsibility, human resources, safety, and so on. And that is chaired by our executive officer for business optimization, who's accountable for sustainable development to the chief executive and, the, and our chairman. I've mentioned the 10 sustainable development outcomes as a kind of framework for people to think about sustainability across ArcelorMittal and um, the, the management of sustainability, as I say, at the steel side. And the way in which we do that, of course, we have all the ISO standards for quality, for environment, for safety and so on. But we also have a set of um, standards that have been developed by stakeholders and the industry specifically for steel and specifically for mining and these are these are standards that we are we we, are, we can get be independently certified against uh, so they're very robust and they provide 
reassurance to the customer that we are managing sustainable development as, as a core part of our business. Next slide, please. And finally, just a few words on disclosure. Um, so CDP was mentioned earlier uh, and, and we've long reported to, C to CDP. We've also reported against the GRI, against the SASB framework, and, and in 2016, we started our journey to integrated reporting. Um, we are now looking forward to the ISSB's work with the Value Reporting Foundation and others to, to really crystallise some consistent um, frameworks for the industry. But more than that, I want to talk about how disclosure and reporting is valuable to the business. Of course, we're disclosing to our stakeholders the, the material things that we, we that they need to know. Um, but reporting is far more than that. It's also about motivating employees. Uh, and we can really see this with our climate action reports, which we started in 2019. This has really become a focal point for our employees to think about how we, de de we are decarbonising in ArcelorMittal. We, now, we published um, a, a, a special report for Europe uh, and then in July last year, our second climate action report. Um, and the, the, uh, the third element of reporting that's been valuable in these climate action reports, but also in our integrated reporting, is how it informs management. The process of actually putting these reports together informs management and enables management to integrate all the complex elements of sustainability and decarbonisation together uh, in one place and come to agreement on the actual the actual way in which we articulate this. And I cannot un emphasise enough the importance of that process. Next slide, please. So it's poll time. So I think we're going to have uh, a poll for all of you. Can we see it on the screen? The question that we're going to have. Christoph? I'm not sure what people can see. Oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah, they see it on the on the chat. OK. So what is the most important aspect of a sustainable, a successful sustainability strategy? That's the question I want to ask you and hear from you what, you, what the things I've covered. What do you think is the most important? I think we can start to see the results now. Targets are a key one, clearly. Strong governance seems to be coming second. We've got coverage across all, all the six different elements that I've talked about. This is very interesting. Still going up. But I think we've got a we've got a couple of clear indications here. So ambitious and credible targets. And I think that's really not surprising in the context that we are in today with our climate challenge. We have to make them ambitious. We've also got to make them credible. They've got to sit within a Paris aligned carbon budget. And I'm seeing also a clear second place for strong governance systems. But I've, I've seen people are also indicating the importance of reporting, um, management, sustainability management also audits, and mechanisms to reassure your customers of your sustainability credentials. Some support for that one as well. Well, thank you for thank you for that. Thanks for your participation there. And I think, from my perspective, all of these things are important. Um, I would say that, wouldn't I? That this is this is this is how I presented this to you. But if we could go to the next slide, I'm just going to step back a little bit and give you spend two or three minutes to tell you of a of a, a very innovative way that ArcelorMittal has approached all of these elements. Um, if you could, so Responsible Steel is a new organisation that's been around for about five years. ArcelorMittal was um, one of the founders, along with um, other steel companies and civil society. 
And what the, what this has done has created a set of standards for the steel industry that every steelmaker can use cons as a consistent way of assessing their management of environmental, social and government aspects, including climate change. And the standards are credible because they've been developed in a multi-stakeholder forum, as I say, with trade unions, NGOs, steelmakers, um, and importantly, customers and suppliers as well. So there's a built into the standard, there's a clear set of disclosure requirements. The standard um, requires uh, certain elements of, of governance. And the audits that take place are, are very rigorous. Um, and over time, we expect the standard to strengthen its requirements. At the moment, the standard is based around the management of every steel site. Um, and it's, it, as I say, it cut, cuts across E, S and G. There's a, within that, there's also a requirement for the site to be part of a company uh, that has a strong climate target and that the site itself has a plan on how it, it will contribute to the company's climate target. So these are things that are being independently audited, audited. and then the, the customer, uh, and I'm very pleased to say that Schneider is a me also a member of Responsible Steel and expects ArcelorMittal to be uh, certifying its sites against Responsible Steel. And in, in the course of 2022, we're going to see an, a new standard that will actually certify the steel that is that is, is, is being produced at a site. And those that requirement, that certification standard, will have in, enhanced requirements, particularly on CO2 and also on responsible sourcing. So in this way, we've we've encapsulated all those things that I've talked about in, in, in one initiative. That, that goes from site level. And of course, the, the audits um, are then collated across the company. And what we're finding in ArcelorMittal is we, we, as we share the audit experience, we, we, we're, we're learning from each other across the company. Next slide, please. We're very, as I say, we're very pleased that Schneider is also a member of, of Responsible Steel, but we've got 115 members. So talking of credible targets and standards, um, I think that this speaks for itself, the, the breadth of the membership um, of, of an organisation like this. So is there something within your, your sector that exists like this? Are you, are you reporting consistently with your competitors? Are your customers clear on what your commitments are in relation to, 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 to your competitors? I think this is, this is, this is what really has lent us um, credibility within the steel sector. Next slide, please. So we were very pleased last year to be the first steel company to actually receive certification, responsible steel certification of our sites in Belgium and Luxembourg and in Germany. And just this month, last week, we we were very pleased to announce us the certification of our steel plant in Tuberau in Brazil. So I'll move on from responsible steel now to talk about climate. So next, next slide, please. And one more, thank you. So, as I say, we're a hard to abate sector. We have a very large footprint. We've got a big challenge ahead of us, but we do have a strong starting point. Steel is the most recycled material in the world. We've got 85, 90% recycling rates. And when you look at the CO2 that's emitted in the production of steel, it's comparatively lower than the amount that is emitted in the production of other materials. And steel clearly is a key enabler for the decarbonisation challenge. If you think about the steel that goes into a, the tower of a wind turbine and the foundations of a wind turbine, um, and then you can think about all the other um, sectors that are going to be involved in the low carbon transition and in the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Think about um, energy, uh, uh, energy production, hydrogen production, um, water infrastructure, um, and other social, social and civil infrastructure. Steel is clearly going to have a, a key role to play. Next slide, please. And steel makes up 8% of the global steel emissions. 
And if you look at steel together with cement and chemicals and transports, these are all the sectors that are thought of as hard to abate. There's not an easy, easy way out for, for, for these sectors. But in Arsenal Middle, I think it's, it, it, it's incredibly important not to think of ourselves as a hard to abate sector. We need to think about the context in which we sit, and then we need to think about what is going to make this mission possible. Next slide, please. And we do have a challenge. The, the materials industries, whether it's cement or steel or plastics, they've all been exponentially increasing in terms of, of demand over, over recent decades. And that's likely to continue. And yet only a small proportion of materials comes from recycling. So in plastics, it's only a tenth of the industry. And in steel, it's, it's a third of the, of the industry that's coming from scrap. Next slide, please. And when we look at the low carbon transition, there's going to be more steel required um, for, for, for particularly for the energy sector. As you as you as you transition to more clean sources of energy, you actually need more steel per megawatt hour. And in the IEA report recently, we saw that the demand for steel in the energy sector alone is likely to double by 2030 on an annual basis. Next slide, please. So steel demand is on the up, and 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 although we absolutely need to to be uh, introducing new business models, new circular business models, new modes of efficiency in material efficiency. We are still going to be looking at an increased steel demand to 2050 um, of around two and a half gigatons of steel. And a half of that approximately will come from secondary materials from scrap by 2050, around a third today. But around half of that will come from primary materials. And there lies our challenge. If we recognise that, then we know how big the scale of the challenge is and really where we need to focus our, our, our efforts. If we can use, next slide please. If we can use scrap to make steel, we will have, we will be, we will be emitting around 100 kilograms of CO2 per tonne of steel. But as I said, there's only a, a third of steel production today that can be made from scrap. So the rest is going to have to come from iron ore, which today emits between one and two, this is direct emissions, one and two tons of tons of CO2 per tonne of steel. So that's that's the challenge. Next slide, please. And as I've mentioned, we've got an infinite supply of iron ore, almost, in the world, um, but, a, but a finite supply of scrap. So the focus is on primary steel making and decarbonising the way in which we make primary steel. Next slide, please. So here's the scale of the challenge, and this comes from the Mission Possible Partnership. And they're looking across all the hard to abate sectors and looking at how it, can it be possible to really rise to this challenge. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to get on to exactly how Arthur Mittal has risen to, is, is risen to this challenge over the, over the years since the company was formed in 2007 and, and looking forward in the next decades to come. Next slide, please. So I think it's important to look back at the, at the kind of history of this. So I, I'm, I wanted to start with a, an initial slide or two about the target that we adopted in 2007 when the company was formed for an 8% reduction in CO2. As you remember, our, our target today is a 25% reduction in the, in the next eight years. This was an 8% reduction in in, in over 13 years. And why was why, why was it only 8%? Well, because the costs of decarbonising uh, primary steel making uh, are very, very high. They are, they, they would, if, if we were to adopt um, new methods of, of producing steel today, uh, uh, they wouldn't be commercially viable. We'd be out of business. So we looked at what was feasible in 2007. And really, this is around energy efficiency. And we thought we, look, we looked at it in terms of these three axes. How do we reduce energy? And that was largely around electricity. 
And as you'll see, our scope two emissions just in the last three years have fallen um, from 7.2 to 5.9 percent. But really, the, the lion's share of our emissions comes from uh, scope one. Um, and this is through the use of coal in the blast furnace. So another, the second axis has been about how we recover the energy in our waste gases and use those for other purposes, for, for whether it's through reheating furnaces uh, or in the generation of power. Um, and that's been that's been an enormous contributor to our um, energy efficiency and also our emissions reductions over the years. Uh, and you can see that actually 40% of our electricity is generated from waste gases every year. And, and this is this is across the industry you're seeing. You've seen it over the recent decades, really, really substantial improvements. The third axis is one that wasn't wasn't really considered um, viable until recently. And it's today it's 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 going to take a lot to make it commercially viable. And this is where we're substituting other forms of energy in the place of coal for the reduction of iron ore. Um, and I'll come on to talk about how we can do that. But just before I do that, just a few some examples from our from our eight percent reduction target. So you can see here across our um, across our business a couple of things. One is that we really focused on kind of internal campaigns. So in Europe, we had a very important campaign called the Energize campaign uh, to reduce energy intensity by nine percent um, over over five years. Uh, and and an important important part of that was the campaign to really galvanize action in the US. The the the, the sites we had in the US really focused on uh, the US government's Energy Star um, program and the, the the internal communications and the motivation of employees was incredibly important, as I'm sure you find in your companies. Um, the second element is is the cost saving. Of course, this is the big, big motivator. Um, and you can see some examples there in 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 the US, for example, twenty six million dollars savings just from one year's um, worth of projects in the US. Um, one example, the introduction of various speed drives that brought annual cost savings that were 250 times the initial investment and delivered to 24,000 tons of, of CO2 reductions from uh, from reduced electricity consumption. So a number of different different aspects here, but on the cost, you know, is also the CO2 savings and back in 2015 or so, the CO2 price really wasn't affecting us. But of course, now with with prices that have in Europe gone up to what, 95 euros, 96 euros, we can see that those cost savings uh, are, are multiplying. So these are these are these are projects which I'm sure our, co our colleagues at Schneider can 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 help you with the like of. And they were incredibly important as as the basis, as a foundation for ArcelorMittal. Next slide, please. But really now I want to get on to how we tackling the much bigger challenge of decarbonizing to net zero by 2050 and in the medium term reducing our emissions by 2030. Next slide please. So we've laid out in our second climate action report our roadmap to 2050 and this is one of those things that I mentioned earlier it was incredibly valuable to be able to publish last year. Um, the, the the analysis that went on to, to, to create this across the business and coordinate um, really, I think, has galvanised the entire company um, to think about um, how our emissions need to be reduced and can be reduced in every way, every every aspect of the business. And we we compartmentalised this 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 journey to net zero in terms of, of five different buckets. Next slide, please. Which I think. So here we go. These are the five different, different, different elements, um, levers, if you like, of decarbonisation. And really, this this cuts across the very, very heart of the steelmaking industry, the way in which we make steel today, the way in which we'll make it tomorrow, and the energy, the way in which we 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 use energy 
in the steel making process. And also the, the, the use of secondary materials and of course the use of clean electricity uh, and then the use of offsetting. And, and what we're seeing here is we're really reimagining the business. We're reimagining our sector in order to understand how we can make our decarbonisation a mission possible. So I think we're now going to have another poll. So I don't know if someone could put it up on the screen. Here we go. So this this poll is really about asking you the extent to which you think your journey to net zero will transform your business, whether it will transform your company and the extent to which it will transform your value chain. So there's four different options for you to choose from. Very interesting. Results are very well distributed across the different options. Things won't change that much, but we will be using more clean energy. That's a uh, 28 percent so far. My companies will trans. My company's activities will transform, but my value chain will remain more or less the same. OK, that's interesting. 22 percent. My value chain will transform, but my company will look more or less the same, 15%. And 29% of you think your whole value chain will be changing in the next 30 years. But I think the overall winner is that your, things won't change that much, but we will be using more clean energy. Yeah, I'll take that as the winner. OK, so that's interesting. So that, that leads very nicely into my next slide uh, where where I wanted to just tell you a little bit about how we started our decarbonisation journey and how we came up with our strategy, because really we looked at energy. We looked at how energy, our energy use was going to change. And for, it, for steel making, it's not as simple as plugging in clean electricity. We need to use um, energy or um, in order to reduce iron ore to, to transform it into iron and from there into steel. But the most most uh, carbon intensive element is the, the reduction of iron ore into iron. And so today we use coal. Clearly that's not going to be feasible in the future unless we use carbon capture and storage. Uh, and even then there's, there's, there's questions as to how acceptable that will be in the future. So what are the alternatives? circular forms of carbon. This is where we're using perhaps bio biomass, waste, waste, waste plastics and so on in a in a circular way uh, to reduce iron ore. And then there's the clean electricity option. And by looking at these three vectors, we can see three we can see two different pathways at the moment today for decarbonizing steel making. There is a third, but it's in a, a, a earlier stage of development. So I, I'm just going to talk you briefly through these. Next slide, please. On the smart carbon side, as I say, we can use agricultural waste, forestry waste that would otherwise be decaying. Uh, we can we can turn them into a, a, a form of very. Uh, we, we can form them into, into a, a form of carbon that can be injected into the blast furnace in place of coal. So those emissions. in, in will be balanced uh, by the absorption of CO2 in the in the biomass. Um, but if we're actually using waste, we're also displacing the emissions from the decay of that waste. Now, if we're using 
plastic waste, we're, we're avoiding the, the emissions from incineration of plastics. Um, so there's, the, the, there's other elements that we can use. Now, when we use those in the blast furnace, the CO2 emissions can also be captured and used to make plastics. And then you can start to see how this circular carbon can really work because the plastics can then be collected, uh, turned, into, turned into a purer form of carbon to be injected back into the blast furnace for, for making, for, for, for reducing iron. So you can really see that the, the carbon molecules will really just go round and round rather than being emitted into the atmosphere. Next slide, please. So this is what we call the smart carbon route. Um, and over time, as green hydrogen becomes more affordable, we can use that in, in conjunction with circular carbon and also carbon capture and storage. And this is a really, really um, circular economy way of thinking about steel in which we'd be for every ton of steel, we'd be also uh, making recycled carbon materials as well. And, and also, um, I should mention in the in the making of steel, we also produce slag, which can be used in place of cement. So, so we really become, we can become a, a multi-material um, uh, company. So this is really transforming, not just thinking about the way we, we use energy, but in fact, the way in which our company can can make 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 value in in a low carbon world. Next slide, please. So the other and th th there are two examples of of actually how we're doing this today, and these are projects which will complete by the end of this year. So this is this is really becoming a reality now. Uh, the investment has been around 235 million euros, uh, and they, it, it, there's two elements to it. There's the, the Torero element where we're taking actually waste wood from the construction industry, turning that into um, a highly carbon form of input into the blast furnace. Uh, and then we're collecting the waste gases and turning those into um, bioethanol for the transport industry. Uh, and the savings will be around 350,000 tonnes of CO2. I won't put a, co a, a cost saving on that because that'll depend on the cost of carbon. Um, but I, I can say that this is an this is a um, EBITDA positive um, combination of technologies. It'll be first in the world, uh, and I think it's very exciting to see a completely transformed energy um, energy source and and indeed um, product range coming from from a steel uh, a steel company. So this is this is smart carbon really in, in reality by the end of this year. Next slide, please. The other one, the other alternative route is using hydrogen in place of coal to reduce iron ore. Uh, and if we can use clean electricity to make that hydrogen, it's green hydrogen, and then um, the, the reductant is zero carbon. Um, in order to do that, we need to transform the blast furnace into a direct reduction um, furnace a DRI furnace, as it's known. So a lot of the announcements that Dart Limit has been making recently has been about investing in um, converting to DRI and, and EAF, the electric arc furnace. So that will transform the way in which we use energy. And of course, there's going to be enormous value chain implications of that. Um, next slide, please. If I show you just one example. OK, so this is this is um, the the DRI based route in context where, of course, we can introduce circular carbon and CCS in addition. These, these can all complement each other. And I think that's a, a really important element of our approach is that we're very flexible uh, and our, our innovation portfolio can be very complementary. Next slide, please. So the example of the hydrogen DRI route um, that I'm giving you here, there are many examples in ArcelorMittal now, is in Spain, where we've committed to uh, a, a one million ton DRI plant in uh, the north of Spain, in the Gijón. Uh, and then um, uh, in our electric arc furnace in Sestao, we'll be using um, uh, DRI that will ultimately be produced with clean hydrogen. Um, and we'll be combining that with clean electricity. And this, this will enable us to be carbon neutral by 2025, or I should say net, net zero, zero carbon emissions just to be clear. And this has only been possible with uh, an MOU from the Spanish government um, to, to, to support us with the funding of this, um, th this project, and also uh, a partnership 
in Spain called Hydeal España, a very, very important um, green hydrogen partnership to really deliver uh, hydrogen at scale and a, an affordable price. So you can see here um, the, 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 the realization of the hydrogen route in, in, in the Spain, Spain, in our Spain operations. We've got similar um, commitments in Belgium, in France, in Canada, and all of those have been possible with the support of, of, of government funding, because of course, as I said at the beginning, this is a very, very costly exercise for the steel industry and we cannot do it alone. Next slide, please. So before I finish, I just want to round up with a few um, other important aspects of what, what we call climate leadership within ArcelorMittal. Next slide, please. And the first is how um, our innovation fund, which we call our XCARB innovation fund, is really investing in um, technology opportunities which we believe will help to transform the industry. So we are seeing our value chain transforming. We're seeing our own operations transforming uh, and we're investing in the future value chains of, of, of the industry, whether it's in concentrated solar power in a company called Heligen or in, in energy storage, a company called Form, Form Energy or in the smart carbon technologies I've talked about. Um, our, our partnership with Lanzatech, we've now, we've now taken an equity stake in, in, in the company, or in um, green hydrogen um, electrolysis uh, in, in a company called H2 Pro. And then we're contributing to a much bigger uh, consortium of companies as an anchor partner of the Breakthrough Energy Catalyst. So really thinking beyond the bounds of ArcelorMittal today to the ArcelorMittal and the steel sector of the future to capture value there. Next slide, please. And in terms of our customers, um, we are innovating all the time to be able to meet our customers' needs. So where our customers want to reduce their scope three emissions, we, we, we're offering two, two offers uh, at the moment, uh, both under the banner of XCARB, um, which really represents all the efforts that we are making to decarbonize um, our, our company. And I think going back to the communications um, point I made earlier, I think this is really a really important part for us, Little, of our approach is to is to brand the the the, the efforts that we, we we're making. Um, so we've got green steel certificates which capture the CO2 savings in our primary steel making, uh, and our recycled and renewably produced offer uh, where we're making steel in from scrap in the EAF. Um, and alongside that, we offer we offer a comprehensive set of EPDs and LCAs. Um, the CDP submission that, that was mentioned earlier, and we report it very clearly against the TCFD. Next slide, please. And finally, I just want to mention all of the numerous carbon and climate initiatives that are out there, and I'm sure you're all experiencing the same thing. But ArcelorMittal has made it um, a priority to be at the table in these initiatives, to ensure that the initiatives are developing standards um, and protocols that make sense to our sector, um, and um, that will be really shaping the way in which our customers uh, and our investors see our sector in the future. So I'm just going to leave you with a few, a few final final thoughts on the final slide. Could you move the slide forward? Thank you. So I've talked about communication really being key to galvanizing galvanizing momentum within our employees at ArcelorMittal and keeping it a positive message. Um, and I talked a lot about our context because this is very important to the way in which ArcelorMittal has to think about its own decarbonisation strategy. So make sure your strategy is your own, it fits in your own context, your own reality, despite all the frameworks that are out there. Um, the energy efficiency piece and the low hanging fruit incredibly important as a foundation but clearly today with the ambitions that we need this isn't going to be enough so we need to think about uh, the bigger transformations and where they're not possible today as i mentioned when we first set out on this road that, 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 that they didn't seem to be in sight so we've really made a big effort to think about what changes will be, will be needed to enable us to get there what policy changes will be needed what funding will be needed what skills will be needed and what value chain partnerships um, can make these, these transformations possible. And finally, 
And my point about stakeholder initiatives, if you're not if you're not listening in on those initiatives, you don't know what's coming around the corner. So I do think it's important to, to keep engaged with those stakeholder initiatives. So I'll leave it there and very happy to to move on to questions. Thanks. Christine. Really? Thank you, Annie. Thanks. Thanks a lot for this uh, insightful presentation. Um, really appreciate it and really showing to all of us here that, as we say, even in a hard to abate uh, sector, even where where we believe or we have the belief that it's hard to decarbonize, uh, it is possible to decarbonize big time. It started, as, as you say, as a commitment from the from the executives, from the top of the, the company. Uh, follows by uh, ambitious and bold goals, and then being creative, as you show. Uh, personally, I was happy to see that uh, you implement the smart carbon uh, technology in my home country. So thank you for that, <laughs> saving some carbon in my home country. So be, uh, let's see if we have any questions, uh, but I think we have some. Haley, do we have some questions? Yes, sure, definitely. Uh, uh, maybe we can start with this, this question. Uh, it's from Bona, and he asks uh, if there is any guideline on uh, how to decide if uh, carbon goal should be intensity or absolute base. So maybe any you could share from your company's sure. point of view. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Bona. Thanks for that. Um, I think ultimately it depends how tied your carbon emissions are uh, to the to the unit of production um, and that very much depends on your sector in the hard to abate sector or the mission possible sectors um, it tends to be very inextricably linked uh, and so uh, if we if we were to double our production or half our production in the next 10 years that would have a a, a very key impact on our emissions so in terms of the the target for those those in, in carbon intensive sectors, um, the guidance is to to actually do it on a carbon intensity basis um, from the SBTI. Um, it doesn't that doesn't prevent you from doing it on an absolute basis, uh, but it makes it a little bit more challenging because you you'd be having to revise it with the changes to your to your business over over time. Um, but ultimately, you have a carbon budget for your sector. Um, the the whole the whole the whole economy has a, a closed carbon envelope in, within which we must keep, um, and um, there are there are emerging kind of consensus from the IEA and others on how that carbon budget is divided up between sectors. And if your sector has a carbon budget, if, if that's specified, um, particularly by the SBTI, uh, then then that's the th that gives you the trajectory to to 2050 that your sector has to follow. Now, the important thing there is that's talking about the global industry and depending on which part of the world you're in, um, that trajectory might look a little different. From ArcelorMittal's perspective, we're a global company, but we also operate in very different parts of the world, some of which have no carbon price, um, some of which are only just starting on their industrialization journey. Uh, and so we have to take all of those things into account. So I would say the the target has to be on a for us on, on a intensity basis um but in terms of how we calculate it we've got to go back to absolute emissions we've got to go back to our production levels um and 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 our technology in relation to those productions in order to be able to forecast forwards thank any, you thank you yeah any other question Haley? thank you Annie. yeah yeah sure so here's another question uh, for Annie from Julian. Uh, he asks, uh, at the beginning of the project, after putting in place some uh, KPI, uh, what was your strategy to uh, identify and choose the actions to be done? Uh, and uh, do you have any implemented internal audit or did you use external helps? Yeah, that's a great question, Julian. Um, now, ArcelorMittal is a very decentralized business. Um, uh, and we're also a very large business. Um, uh, and so in every steel making site, uh, there is a, 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 a there, there are a lot of experts on energy, uh, on iron making, steel making, all of whom um, can come up with a, a plan to reduce CO2. And that is so so that is what how we went about developing our target. We asked all of our sites to come up with a plan. 
Um, and then our corporate uh, CTO team also did a sort of top down analysis uh, to look at um, how re reasonable those bottom up plans were and how much more we thought they could do. Um, and then it becomes a kind of a, a, a process of synthesis between the, the bottom up and the top down process um, till, till we get agreement. But ultimately, the, 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 the target at, at group level was taken by our chief executive, uh, Aditya Mittal. Um, and so the, the, there is a very important process in which um, we, we are verifying all the plans to ensure that they all add up um, to our target. And yes, there is uh, a, an, audit, an audit process uh, as, uh, as such to um, keep on top of the plans, um, to uh, report back. We, we do it at segment level or regional level. And then that, that reports into the corporate level CTO. Um, and then in terms of the actual implementation, um, well, there's a number of different audits that we do on this. You won't be surprised to hear. Um, we are collecting, uh, when, we're, when we're thinking about the carbon savings we're making from our investments, we are um, offering those to our customers in the form of green steel certificates. That has an independent audit process. Um, when we are um, reporting to our investors, uh, our carbon reporting process is independently audited. Um, when we report to the emissions trading scheme, there's also independent audits for that. Um, but in terms of our um, overall target um, process, um, that's more of an internal audit um, process that, 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 that goes into our, our constant tracking of the target. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. I think we have oh. still time for one last question, right? Yes, yes. So one last question from uh, from Yi Fei. Uh, uh, is there any measure on the ratio of carbon saved and money spent? Also, is there any uh, is that ratio comparable with other companies? And uh, if if it is uh, meaningful? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, look, our 25 percent reduction target by 2030, uh, we've put a 10 billion dollar capex envelope around that um, and depending on the project um, that that can be costing uh, between uh, for it, it, any, anywhere between sort of I think three and six hundred um, dollars a, a per ton of co2 so you can see that the cost of that um, now whether that, that is largely in line with our competitors absolutely um, the key, the key thing, is uh, that that the none of this is affordable um, at current um, carbon prices, and and with 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 the market the way it is today, um, we 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 have to have funding to help support that um, those 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 kind of costs clearly, um, and we also need really importantly on your competitor point, we need a level playing field, so that we we need to ensure that. When we're investing in these decarbonisation initiatives, um, the, the steel we're selling is not going to be undercut by steel that is higher emitting, um, that is that is playing in the same market. So, where, for example, in Europe we have a cost on carbon, um, and that together with public funding can help us uh, make these investments viable. Um, We've also we, 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 we've also got imports from outside of Europe that are coming in and it's not sub subject to the same price on carbon. So we need to make sure that there's a there's a level playing field between the two. Um, and you'll have heard of um, discussions at the European level for a carbon border adjustment. And that's exactly what that's aimed at aimed at doing. So, uh, yes, our, our, our emission savings are, are in line with our competitors, but only within the, 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 the context of um, a carbon system uh, and hence the need for a carbon border adjustment. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Annie, for your time. I know in your busy agenda it was difficult to find. I really appreciate your investment in to this presentation here. Ten, thanks to all of you uh, to for your engagement. Uh, very interesting questions. So we will We'll end it here. Uh, I know this session, I was about to say I hope, but I know this session was very useful for all of us. We'll see you back next month with another session shedding light on another aspect of decarbonization. Again, big thank you.
and have a great rest of day. Bye-bye.